never ends. It is Saturday night at 11 p.m. And we got our special guests again. We have Matthew Pose and James Larson. And we're going to be doing speaker talk tonight. How are you doing, my friends? I'm doing pretty good. I, I think, James, how are you? We're, we're, I think we're both very well tonight. <laughs> yeah. Great. I just want to say as a caveat, I can't get the headphones to work tonight. They changed something with StreamYard software. When I plug it in, I lose video. So there might be some echo. Apologize for that, my friends. I know people will always bitch down below, but you know what? We're here giving you information to disseminate for yourselves. We're not going to be doing listening tests over YouTube like you've been seeing a lot on these YouTube channels lately. We're going to give you some straight facts with real measurements, real listening impressions that we've had during these reviews and let you guys decide which speakers you want. So what I think is pretty amazing is the fact that we're doing a YouTube video with Monoprice and Revel in the same video. Wind the clocks back five years ago. Did you ever think you were going to hear the words Monoprice and Revel in the same sentence? Definitely not. I mean, Monoprice has always offered value products, but in many cases, value was they made the cheapest possible thing and it actually worked and that was pretty good. The fact that they're now producing something as competent as this is impressive. Yeah, they've Monoprice has come a long way over the last couple of years. You know, they're doing the right type of partnerships, whether it's their electronics that they have, they're working with ATI or their new processor that's going to be released at Cedia that's backed by Datasat. And now I'm not sure who's doing their speaker design other than the fact it's being certified by THX. And the THX specs actually have some real meaning behind them. So, James, I'm going to let you give a little overview of the monoprice speakers that we're talking about. And then I'll put up some measurements and some pictures and stuff like that. Why don't you give a quick rundown of those speakers that you reviewed, the retail price, the model number, all that stuff, the description of what they are. And then we'll do some screen share and talk more about it. OK, sure. Um, the, the speaker behind me is the uh, the one we reviewed. Well, I, we reviewed the mini tower and also the center speaker. We don't have the center speaker set up. Right now, by the way, Gene, you mentioned Monoprice's partners. Um, for the speakers, it was uh, Clarity Audio. And Clarity is also the people, uh, Arundel has their THX stuff built by um, Clarity. And uh, XTZ has those uh, their cinema line built by Clarity. Um, Aula Audio had the X13 built. So really good designers, really good manufacturers. And um, you know a good source. You know, to partner up for for a lot for speakers or subwoofers. Clarity also does um, the Monoprice THX subs. So oh, wow. you know, yeah. So, anyways, um, the speakers behind us, the one we're going to talk about tonight is the 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 uh, Mini Tower. I guess the, their name is like the THX dash three six five T. We'll just call them the THX Mini Towers. Um, it's a I know it's a mouthful. I know it's, it's just like these. It's like these model numbers for Dayton Audio and and the other Monoprice stuff. It's like why can't you guys come up with a catchy name instead of all this? It's so uh, cerebral. Or, or just a name. Just call it like John or John. Joe or something. <laughs> the, I, the, the Dominator. The Dominator. Yeah, the Dominator. It looks. It's a beefy looking guy. You could call this the Dominator, and people would remember it. That's the thing. Yeah, get the Monoprice Dominator. Right. That's yep. that's what would stick in your head more than the. The oh the, the 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 real model number is some like it's just like a, a five letter, I mean five number number really it's just it's you know it's like the three five one eight one or it's it's ridiculous right but yeah. anyways anyways this is uh we'll just call it the mini tower um it, you can it's a three way bookshelf they call it a, a, a mini tower. I, I say it's a bookshelf speaker because it's a stand, it's a stand mount speaker, right? And um, it's a three way speaker. It's it's a it's a heck of a three way speaker. You can see it's got two six point five inch woofers. It's got a, a two inch dome mid range and a one inch dome tweeter. It's it's in a sealed box. Also, it has um yeah, it, it's a sealed cabinet, and um, it also has a THX like a. Uh, Oh, not THX, like an Adobe Atmos kind of like, you know, uh, speaker built in the top. So it's actually two speakers in one here. I'll try to show you it. So the what you, I think, uh, Gene, you call that bouncy house. Yeah. Right? The, bounty, got the yeah. bouncy house. Yeah. It does. It's, it's a beefy speaker. It's like yeah. 20, over 25 pounds. Now that's not a cheap ceiling reflecting driver though. That's actually a coaxial two-way 
Yeah. It's a decent quality driver that they've Yeah, stuck it's in actually there. not a bad driver. I, I did measure it. If you can look on the review to see how the driver measures, it's actually a really nice flat mid-range. Um, so it's a coaxial driver. You can see it has a little like a 0.6-inch um, dome tweeter inside of a, I think this is like five and a quarter woofer. Yeah. So like it actually doesn't work too bad. The only question is, and I didn't actually test this. I wasn't that interested in the in the uh, Atmos part of the speaker. I'm I'm more interested in just like how the how high of a fidelity the 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 real part of the speaker is, right? So I guess the uh, the catch is with the Atmos speakers, like you don't want direct sound from the Atmos speaker to hit the the, the listener right like directly, right? Mm -hmm. You want the it to be all just a, a, a reflected sound, okay? That's the only way this thing can work, right? And so what I didn't really test and what I think me and Matt can do later in the week is like, or just Matt can do it on his own, I trust him, is to- Are you to, sure? Yeah, well, to, to see how, to see how, how well it reflects sound, how much of the sound seems like it's coming from above you instead of right in front of you. So he's gonna like, he's gonna hook it up, right? just the atmos part and i guess he'll give us a report how well the reflected part of it works as opposed to direct sound but you know what though like i said i'm not too interested in the uh, atmos part i think we should like talk more about the um the uh regular speaker which is really cool i mean it's a it's actually thx ultra certified um it's a beefy beefy bookshelf speaker and it doesn't cost a fortune did i did i mention the price it's 500 dollars for a THX Ultra certified speaker, which is like, I mean, look at all the other THX Ultra certified speakers. They're not $500, they're much more expensive, you know? This is 500 each, right? So yeah, like, yeah, 500 yeah, each, yes. Yeah. So like, so, it, so a couple of questions about the speaker we're looking at now, let's get, without counting the Atmos driver, we could talk about that later or when Matt does his tests on it. Just the front firing drivers that we're looking at, those two six and a half, so they run the same bandwidth. They're, it's, so it's like an MTM. So it's yes. got a mid tweeter in the middle, and then those two outer drivers are in an MTM configuration. They're both playing the same bandwidth, right? Yes, yeah, so you can consider this kind of an MTM driver, you know, because like, I guess you could consider the, the acoustic center of the speaker to be kind of between the mid range and, and uh, tweeter, and so these would kind of flank that like um, equilaterally. So like, um, you know, it, it's like an MTM kind of. Right. So yeah. So I think so okay. It's a sealed design, and and if it's if it's meeting THX spec, then that probably means that it has um, 12 dB per roll off on the high pass on it, so it doesn't have a lot of bass about no. below 80 hertz, correct? No, it, it's it's designed to be used with a subwoofer. If you look at, uh, I mean, I I do uh, on the review. There's ground plane measurements of the bass response, and you can see it's actually almost like a textbook THX. Uh, sealed roll off. It's it's like rolls off at like kind of like 90, 80 hertz, and it's it's just a really it's a perfect low frequency response for THX spec. You know, it, it just nails it. So yeah. So what happens in that case is because the 12 dB per octave um, roll off on that plus the 12 dB per octave in your processor, that matches up with a 24 dB per octave roll off on a subwoofer in your base management. So then you. Theoretically, of course, because in room is different, but theoretically, you're going to get perfect integration at the crossover point if you use a THX speaker with its 80 hertz recommended crossover setting and a subwoofer. Yeah, that that's correct, and that that you know is actually unusual even among some of the THX speakers to see such perfect adherence to that. So it was it was good that they did such a good job with the design, but it does mean that this is a, this is actually a really good speaker. So it you know, what James was pointing out when he brought him over was because it is a THX speaker, you have to use them with a subwoofer. And, you know, you see those two six and a half inch drivers and you think that's pretty beefy, probably has decent bass, but they really don't. So somebody just, I just wanted to jump this question in here. You have to remember that THX has different levels of qualification or certification. Um, that's true for like the electronics when you have ultra and you have select two and stuff. Are there different levels for when the THX yeah. speakers are also certified? So what level would this one be certified to? Do you ultra, know? Right. Th this is, these are um, THX ultra certified. That means they're, they're supposed to run in a room like larger than I think 3000 3, cubic feet to so 5,000. Okay. There's, there's four levels, right? 
I guess we should tell them because like it was just almost like I think two years ago or THX revamped their certifications for loudspeakers. Yeah. So there's there's THX Compact, which is for a small room. I can't remember all exact cubic feet. You know, these there's THX Compact, there's THX Select, which is for like a medium sized room. And, and by the, the like the, the baby brother to these, the the mono price also has a uh, a two-way speaker that uses the the woofer and the tweeter on these, and it's not a three-way. And um, that's THX Select certified for like a medium-sized room. These are THX Ultra for kind of a, a medium to large room, and then THX has one more called THX Dominus, which is new, which is not like the old, and it's like five thousand cubic feet and above. I can't exactly remember the exact numbers for this, but you can check on THX website, and that's. It, the, 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 I don't think any product has like, gotten the Dominus certification. It would be such a stiff, like it's such a high bar, a, a high standard to clear that I don't, I've never heard of anything getting a, a Dominus certification, but when they do, that's going to be a really cool like speaker or a subwoofer because it, it has to be huge and it has to be, you know, it, it'll just be a monster. It'll be it'll be um, the kind of speaker that Grandpa Simpson will sit down and watch a movie to, and his teeth will explode. <laughs> yeah. If you remember yeah. that episode of The Simpsons when it wasn't loud enough. Yes, for yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. So okay, so uh, on the right corner over here, we have the Mono Price um, THX three sixty five T or whatever the hell the thing is called for five. It's called a mini tower. Yeah. yeah. On the left side, we have the Revel, and that's the M126BE bookshelf speaker. It has all beryllium drivers. It's just a standard mm. two-way design with state-of-the-art drive technology in it, right? Well, it's you explained it. It's the beryllium just tweeter, right? Yeah, the, the beryllium is just the tweeter. The uh, woofer is like... Oh, it's uh, aluminum or ceramic? Yeah, it's like the other CM... Whatever. Yeah. It's, a, a, it's a basically anodized aluminum. So it's aluminum with layered with ceramic. So here's an interesting question because we talked about the model price is a bigger speaker. It's a sealed design. It's designed to roll off the base. Technically speaking, the Revel probably has deeper bass extension. Oh, yeah. The smaller Revel speaker has deeper bass extension than the model price. So if you were doing if you were doing just a two channel setup in a small room, and obviously the the Revel is a four thousand dollar pair speaker, it's much more expensive. But that would be more of an appropriate speaker without a subwoofer if you're going to set up a two-channel system For sure. without yeah. subs. Now, that one comes with port plugs, though, right? So you could conceivably set it up to be a little bit more like the Mono Price if you sure. want to use it in a home theater, or you can use it with the ports open. So one thing I'll note for everybody was uh, I, I wasn't thinking when we were setting these up. We got everything dialed in for the Mono Price with the subwoofer, and they sounded good. We got it balanced pretty well. And then we threw the the Revels in, and it did not sound it sounded a little bit too bass heavy. And uh, I actually turned the subwoofer down like ten decibels to get it balanced out, and it still sounded bass heavy. And part of the issue was the overlap between the subwoofer and that extra output it had down. Well, to also the meters. Revels would probably have less sensitivity than the Mono Price speakers. That was a little bit of the issue. Yeah, they do seem to be less sensitive. They they don't play as loud, and. Uh, I had to turn it up to get the same volume levels, but I think it, also the bass response was much more substantial from the Revels themselves, which made it so that when I uh, put the subwoofer on as well, I had to make significant adjustments to get it to integrate better and sound more even. And it always, yeah. to me, sounded a little bit bass heavier. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So let me do a little screen share here um, so we could kind of show people all the measurements and you could kind of walk us through the review a little bit. Let's make sure this works. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have the mono price speakers up. This is the center channel, my friends. This is basically the same driver topology as the bookshelf, only it doesn't have the Atmos driver and it's horizontally mounted. So the nice thing about this design for a center channel is the mid and the tweeter are um, vertically oriented instead of horizontally oriented. So it gives you better um, dispersion on, you know, to the left and right or lateral of the speaker. So it gives you a wider listening area. Yep. Much, much better yeah. than, than conventional MTM right. design. Yeah. James will show you later in the measurements, but the speaker does measure better than most. It still shows lobing, but it's not nearly as bad as most. Yeah. So my only concern is when you go with a two inch dome mid range like this, it has to have a dynamic output disadvantaged 
to a typical five or six inch cone driver, wouldn't you think? Uh, actually, I think that they, I think it actually increases, they're only operating over a small bandwidth. So I think it actually increases the dynamic range of the speakers overall in general. I think those two and three inch dome mid ranges um, have quite a bit of output. So it's not going down as low in frequency and then these other two woofers are picking that up, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if they listed the crossover point, but typically these things don't play much below 300 hertz. Often the crossover points are more like 500 hertz. Yeah, Actually, it, it, it says 550 hertz here. Yeah, okay. that's very common. That that Yeah, so I mean, it's not playing that low. It doesn't need to actually have all that much excursion. Gotcha. Go ahead, sorry, James. Yeah, it's like, well, it is THX certified. <laughs> so it, it has the output. It has a dynamic range. So like the, the you know, it couldn't get that certification unless it really could rock, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, so just, you know, we, just we basically to... Just to let you guys know, um, Matt, the sensitivity on these speakers is 89.5 dB. That's almost 90 dB. I suspect the Rebels is probably around 86, 87. I'm just kind of curious here. Yeah, see, 86 dB. So you're at a 3 dB sensitivity disadvantage with a speaker like this. That's probably another reason why you had to lower the sub when you switched over to the Rebels. Yeah, I lowered it more than three decibels, but you're right. And and that was pretty obvious that the sensitivity difference uh, was one of the first things I noticed when I switched over. Yeah. So, guys, if you actually do a comparison to these speakers, if you do, if for some reason you have these speakers at home, um, you're <laughs> going to have to make sure you level match, obviously. <laughs> I don't know how many of you guys just randomly decide to pick up a four hundred or five hundred dollar a piece for a speaker and versus a two thousand dollar. Yeah, yeah. That's you'd not be surprised. You'd be, you know, why? Because the old mantra is price does not always dictate quality. But well, when you're, you're right. But when you're dealing with products that are properly engineered, such as these mo these mono price speakers, and of course Revel. Price starts to matter because they're not wasting money on marketing BS or they're not wasting money on esoteric things that don't make a difference in sound. In this case, you know, everything on this speaker is going towards the engineering of the speaker, not so much the cosmetics. Right. Yeah, you can definitely tell. I, mean, I, go, I know on the video right now, you guys can't tell, but when you hold these speakers, there's a substantial difference in build quality. And it's kind of like for those people who are, let's say, are into cars. You know, you walk up to a top of the line, uh, let's say a Rolls Royce, and then you, or even a, like a Mercedes S Class, uh, and then you walk over to like, let's say a, a Mazda. Mazdas are very well engineered. They, they have excellent looking interiors. They look very sharp. But when you start to feel things and look closely, you can tell where money was spent and the quality isn't as good. When you look at this, these are nice looking speakers. The finish actually looks pretty cool, but it's definitely a cheaper looking and feeling. Yeah, finish. it's, it's, it's a kind of a cheap vinyl wrap i've seen on on much cheaper speakers so you know that much of the manufacturing cost of this has gone to the actual you know the parts that matter if you're concerned about sound quality yeah so you could see like uh when james took apart these speakers i mean um some cost cutting in the cabinetry obviously but and also yeah. the drivers are they're stamped baskets instead of cast which isn't necessarily a bad thing i don't know how high of a gauge of steel they used on these baskets. It looks like it's got some reinforcement over here. It's like it's, it's dimpled over here. Well, it looks like it's got some under spider venting, which is, um, you know, a sign of some extra engineering that went into it. Is that, is that right? Is that what I see? Uh, yeah, it's, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty beefy, it's a pretty beefy woofer. And then they have their own enclosure for the mid range here, which is nice. Um, let me see over here. Yeah, they're using some good parts here. They have some uh, mylar caps. It's not all electrolytic. Some air core inductors, ceramic resistors. I mean, it looks like this thing is has been well thought out. You know, the inductors are orthogonally located, so they don't have as much mutual coupling. Yeah, it's the the engineering is good. I mean, it's it's clarity. I know the the engineer Dan Rahmer. He's a very uh very sharp guy. Everything he makes is going to be is bound to be really good so 100 100 you know, volt caps 100 volt caps is a good sign that these things can handle yeah. some good amount of power oh they have to you know to go after thx uh ultra ultra certification so i want to open up the pictures of the mono price so you can go over some of this uh the measurements so you see the measurement here for the this is for the center speaker sure do you I mean, I, 
okay, this is a, a spinorama type measurement, right? And I think a lot of these curves, it, it would take some time to explain what these curves mean. But I think I'll just focus on the, the on axis and the listening window. Okay, so the, the top curve is like the, the blue curve is the on axis, the direct axis, direct on axis response, right? And it's not bad. You can see it's got um, the, the base is a little bit higher in level than the uh, mid range and, and treble. So, like, um, it's a warmer speaker, but it's still quite neutral. But what's more important is the shape of the, uh, the red line, which is the listening window. And this is like, um, on axis out to 30 degrees on the horizontal and up to 15 degrees in the vertical. So it's basically stuff that's happening in front of it where people are going to be, where, where people are going to be. So right. um, where you listen. Yeah, this where, and, and the other curves aren't is they don't mean that much. They have meaning, but we wrote an article about it. And if for those readers who really want to know, they can read it. It's, it's kind of too much to get into here, but yeah. like, the shape is is really good for these, and um, it, it's going to be a little bit more on the warmer side. I don't think these are like totally neutral. This is not a ruler flat response, but it's really good. It's very easy to listen to. They sound great, and um, these kind of explain why. Yeah, I well, mean, and, we... and the off axis response is consistent. You know, I mean, that, right. yes. like the shape of it is good. Yeah, if we take a minute to, to just look at why this is good, a perfect speaker, every one of those lines would have the same shape to it. They just would be at different levels. You would expect the on axis and the listening axis to be basically identical, but maybe slightly different levels. And then you would expect the early reflection, for instance, to have the exact same shape, but you would want it to be down in level at least a little bit. In an ideal world, yes. Right, in an ideal world. So these obviously don't look exactly the same, but they look substantially similar. There's no major, major differences. And that's, sure, that's yes. a good sign that the response is good. Um, and I think we also see some signs that there's some, maybe some diffraction effects and reflections on the front of the enclosure here, but that they go away, you know, in the average across that listening axis. So it's, it's a good sign that in room, this is probably a pretty neutral speaker. Yeah, it's, it's a good response. Um, the only way you could really know is like comparing it to others, but it's it's overall very really good. It's like like Max said, it's consistent. The uh, the on axis listening window, early reflections curve, and sound power are actually really consistent with each other. And there's uh so it's it's gonna sound the same anywhere where you are, and it it it's good for like imaging and and. and... Now this is a picture of a squid. This is not well, a. I thought this is how I thought this is how the predator views frequency. <laughs> Okay, this we should explain this. Okay, um, this is a polar map. Now this um, is from the center channel too. So actually, this yeah, is this is the something. center channel gene. So it's labeled right. above, and and like this like shows the responses, the, the dispersion. It's, it's a picture of the dispersion. So the center, like imagine, uh, and it, you can see how symmetrical it looks around like a, a bar going through the center of it horizontally, right? Well, that's the on-axis response, and everything that goes out from that, uh, like a, a that center, like line that it's symmetrical about, is the off-axis response. So, and so you're you're going out I, as you go out from the from the center of the speaker, you can see that, like for instance, the highs uh, are kind of getting rolled off a little bit. How it has like a, almost a tree-like look, right? Well, that's the that's the high trouble on the um on the far right end of that. So um. Yeah, so the cone head shape that you see on the squid is actually a result of the tweeter beaming, basically. Yeah. So it's starting to have very narrow directivity up there. And so it creates this cone shape. The, the red basically means that it's the highest output. In a sure. perfect speaker, you would have sort of a rainbow effect. It would be red in the middle and it would slowly fade, fade to blue as you went out to the up top and bottom. If you go back to where the eyeballs are there on the squid, <laughs> that actually is part of this issue with the that we were talking about earlier that you typically see in center channels that are horizontally arrayed MTMs, um, and then next to it is the other part of that problem. So this this sure. So like okay, do you, you see? I guess that's at like 500 hertz. There, there's like waistband. You see those green bands at like say 500 hertz that kind of squeezes in the center of the that, that plot, do you see what I'm talking about, Gene? Yes. Okay, that's from um, the two woofers, right? So they're horizontally aligned and they're, they're canceling each other out, yeah. right? 
at that distance. And that's like at, I guess, a 50, it starts at a 50 degree angle. So what this picture is telling us at a 50 degree angle, the woofers actually start canceling out because they're at really uh, quite a bit dis different distance from each other, okay? But out, out to 50 degrees, they're actually, they're, they're, they're getting along pretty well. There's no real interference going on. And so what this, what I guess you should be looking for in this is like where there's like solid or red, that's where the speaker is, where, th where there's a solid color on, on the horizontal, on, on a, like a horizontal line, that's where the speaker will sound the same. What, that's where it'll sound consistent. So well, like, um, go ahead. And I, and I think it's important to note that nobody in a theater room is listening to a speaker at 50 degrees off axis. You would be plastered up against the sidewall. Sure, and yeah. You, yeah but you don't want to be sitting at a sidewall. It, it still makes a difference. You still want it to be as consistent as possible, even off axis, even at a 50 degree angle or, or further, because you're still going to be hearing uh, the reflections. That's that's going to be like an earlier reflection, and it's yeah. going to be coming right at you. And that'll also characterize the uh, sound of the speaker. So this right. this actually, so while that, that well, this looks a little rough at, say, I, I guess, uh, 300 hertz. There, there's that like lobing. I mean, there's that interference, that cancellation you can see around. But it is lobing. That's the proper. It, it is lobing, and um, this is actually relatively good. This is not perfect. This is not. The speaker doesn't have perfect directivity. You can see at at that flare, I say a thousand hertz, and the lobing at like say five hundred hertz. It's not, the per directivity isn't perfect, but for a center speaker, this is actually very good. Um, I, you know, the, I've measured other center speakers. This is among the best, right? For this type of measurement, so this is um, this is actually really good. And again, the only way you can really tell is by comparing it to others. And I think we should also mention that for the for the the viewers who want to know about these charts, we just ran a series of articles that explain their their meaning and how how to look at them and how what they tell you about a speaker. So that's something you might maybe want to link to in the video. You know? Yeah, I could do that. So here's here's the mini tower polar map, and you could see. There's a lot less lobing in that area. In fact, there's yeah. no lobing here. There's no lobing in that water. area. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this shows you how big a difference it is uh, looking across the horizontal dispersion axis when you have the woofers next to each other like that in the center channel versus vertically. Now, you, well, anyway, the point is that this is much better. So in a perfect world, you wouldn't want a speaker doing what the center channel is doing. But like James said, this is actually better than the vast majority of center channels of that style, <laughs> which is what makes it so good. I mean, the fact that the lobing doesn't become so serious until about 50 degrees. Oh, is really, that's good. Yeah, oh, I mean, geez. you often see it by like 20, 30 degrees, exactly, which yes. is potentially within the area we're listening And guys, to. you got to remember, these speakers are $500 each. In fact, the center channel is even $100 less because it doesn't have the Atmos driver, I believe. So that's a $400 center channel, right? That's yeah. an excellent, excellent performance for a $400 um, I mean, That's That's excellent. Channel. I mean, realistically, these measurements are excellent for any price. I mean, if this yeah, they're speaker- good. They're yeah. just good measurements. Yeah, these are good measurements. Wow, yeah. now look at this one. If you look at the mini tower, the on axis and listening window are pretty, they follow pretty much yes. a yeah. similar shape. Yeah, that, that, that's a, it's a pretty good shape. Um, I, I, could, I could say, I guess I, I measure, you know, I have to measure all of the horizontal and vertical axis. I mean, the, the on axis response isn't, perfectly flat as you see it's it's good if you look at the window like the plus or minus 3 db or whatever wh however you want to characterize the window it's pretty good but i i could actually measure it actually got flatter at a 10 degree angle above the like the reference axis so you could actually if you wanted to listen to these for a flatter effect listen to these at a 10 degree angle above the tweeter, you know, yeah. not that it makes, it won't change the sound much, but it makes for a prettier graph. It, you so know. you could just put them lower to the ground than you would right. normally put. You don't have to, you don't have to sit tweet ear level with the tweeter is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And my speaker stands that I was using, which are designed for studio monitors and they're behind me here, they were too tall for these speakers. So I actually tilted them down to try to mimic that as best I could. But, you know, I think people probably are wondering subjectively what all those measurements mean. I mean, how did these sound? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good, yeah. yeah. Good, the, that's it. You just summarize I it. I, I wish I could be more articulate than that all right off the top of my head, but... Um, you could read the review for all the articulate. Yeah, we have a review right? and I go into way more People depth. don't read anymore. They want you to set up a microphone in your room and do the listening comparisons 
and let them listen through their Bluetooth headphones. Yeah, we well we can. It's do that as good as really any well. measurement, right? Or as any anything I can tell you. Yeah. Well, so I'll I'll give you my opinion. How's this? I we set them up in the room. They were the first speakers we listened to today when you came over with them, and uh, my impression was a couple of things. First is that they're very dynamic. I was actually impressed with how loud they could play, and uh, I mean you could like viscerally you could feel them when we were playing, you know, the Welcome to the Jungle song. Was a, a the two cellos for anybody who's familiar with that. It's a two cellos version of Welcome <laughs> to the Jungle. He laughs every time. You're using Guns and Roses as a um, litmus test for sound quality. It's, it, it's, it's a it's a cello cover of Welcome to the Jungle. So it's got a it's like a, a duet of cellos and they're and they're playing Welcome to. It's a it's a really nice sounding recording. It, it it's awfully dorky, but it's a really has a really good uh, like quality recording. You know. It's it's pretty dynamic too because of how they put it together. The point is, we threw that on. Uh, I partly put it on because I, I put it on by accident once. He started laughing, and so now I just have to put it on every time he comes over. Uh, but we played it. We turned it up pretty loud, what to eleven basically, and and we were really rocking out to that song. And I was impressed with how loud they played. But the one thing that I noticed as I went through a bunch of different tracks that I was familiar with was that they were neutral, but they were on the brighter side of neutral, just a little bit. Well, okay. In the upper treble, that's what I thought. Um, and then in terms of bass, like we said earlier, they basically don't have any bass, but they do have, within the range that they operate, a good kick to them because of that dynamic. So well, the advantage there, the the advantage, I know they don't have any low end bass, but let's 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 make a caveat about that. By having dual six and a halfs like that with high sensitivity, they will play a lot louder than a typical two way that's tuned lower when you made them with a subwoofer. Because you right. see a lot of people on forums, they go and buy these massive 18 inch subwoofers and they stack the subs in the front of the room and then they're running two and a half or two way six inch uh, bookshelf <laughs> speakers all around with 86 dB sensitivity. And Helps there's a huge gap in output between the subs and and the and the uh, speakers as yeah, a result. Yeah, 130 decibels of output from their subs and like maybe 95 decibels from those speakers. <laughs> yeah, I, I talk about that in a review by giving up deep bass. Matt says they don't have any bass. That's not really the case. Yeah, they, they need deep bass. Deep right. bass. We're talking about subwoofer band frequencies. These are expected to be mated with the subwoofer at 80 hertz. Okay. So, but that still covers 80 hertz and above is still a lot of bass, right? I mean, considering bass would kind of like be defined as going out to maybe four or 500 hertz, you know? Yeah. Um, like, so, so they, they have all the mid bass and they're pretty good for mid bass. Um, very, they measure very well for bass. So like the it's very neutral, I mean, your room is going to ruin that. Of course, the room acoustics is going to ruin that, but the speakers themselves, beautifully flat response. I found an interesting comment here. I just wanted to put this up real quick. You can tell if a speaker is warm or bright with the measurements. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the idea. I mean, Harman, Harman has what an 85 or an 88% confidence level that they could predict how a speaker is going to subjectively be preferred from a listener just on its anechoic data. It, well, in the term warm or bright, even though it's a subjective term, we have to define it somehow, right? So if you start to actually think of what that would mean, bright means there's too much trouble. Warm means there's not enough trouble. So uh, when you look at measurements, there's, there's kind of two things you can pick out from Spinorama. One is the on axis itself shows you the balance. A perfectly flat speaker should be neutral, ideally, if it's in an anechoic chamber. Um, if the treble seems to be elevated at all, that would be bright. If it's depressed, that would be warm. But then you also want to look at that listening axis, axis and then also the uh, early reflection axis, because a speaker could actually look warm on axis, but if it's very, very wide dispersion, there becomes so much high frequency energy that's reflecting around the room that it tends to still sound bright. The difference being though, that if you have a room that's very dead and you're absorbing most of those reflections, that speaker would still sound warm. Um, yeah, good but, point. But anyway, that, so that's how we can look. That's what we look for, at least when we look at that is both the on axis and then we look at those others just to see, because if the speaker has very wide dispersion, even if it looks like it might be warm, it might actually sound in a room bright. This speaker does not have that wide dispersion. It's what I would call average. Yeah, it's it's not it's not bad. It's pretty good. And, that's and probably pretty, by design too. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I think. it's it's a requirement of a THX. It should have a speaker should have somewhat, you know, have some dispersion. It can't be totally narrow. Um, so yeah, it, it, that's a part of the THX certification. I don't exactly know how much dispersion. 
and you will never find out, right? Even though you break in THX's vaults, right? They don't disclose that kind of information. But well, people were trying to break into Area 51. Can we get yeah. something going into THX? I know, because we, we, we should say, Gene, as you know, THX does not disclose what what it takes to achieve their certifications. It's a very closely guarded secret. Um, you can kind of see what is needed by looking at the measurements for these speakers and the sub subwoofers they reviewed, but like beyond very base things like the speaker should have low distortion at like a, a, a 12 foot distance and um, have to achieve like uh, achieve like 105 dB at peaks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We know that the very base stuff, but beyond that, nothing is known, but you can kind of like divine what it is kind of needed by looking at measurements, you know, so you, you can kind of yeah. figure it out from our reviews, basically. I remember back in the day when John Dahl was at THX and I tried to pin him down on some of these requirements. I'd be like, what's the dispersion requirements for a speaker? He, his response was good. <laughs> so he's yeah. always been cryptic about it. Um, but they have been a little bit more forthcoming about answering these questions. And I think when I go to CD, if I find them, I'll probably pin them down or um, the guys at Monoprice are going to be there. So maybe I'll do a little video interview and follow up there. They won't, they won't tell you I've asked them. I they, will they, tell you this much. Speaking of conspiracies, it's interesting that THX has all these different levels now for subwoofers after we've been doing basaholic ratings for the last seven yeah. or eight years. And there's a lot of correlation with their with their room size ratings to what we're doing. So evidently, people at THX are paying attention to what we're doing, and that's you know flattery. It's good to science. Us. It's good science. No, they, they've good had science, yeah. they've had the, those certifications in place. Not they've redone their certifications, but their 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 new certifications are kind of like almost a renaming of their old ones. Because you know, yeah. do you remember like they Ultra Two, levels. right? So they've always had them. They kind of redid them a little bit. I don't know how much they've been paying attention to what we've been doing, but they, they've had their certifications for their, like basically it was, they're talking about dynamic range among other things in place since for, for a long time. You know, I don't know when they launched their original certifications, but it's been there for a while, years, many years. Yeah, I still think that our extreme base of holic rating is probably most, is still the most stringent in the industry. And if you, if a subwoofer meets that, it's it's harder to meet that than to meet an ultra two from well, ultra two maybe, but, but dominus is like i think it's a, i don't know about dominus though that you just threw a wild card at me i never heard of dominus before well you should look it up on the thx site because the thx site because i don't think i'm not sure if there's any speaker being manufactured or subwoofer or speaker being manufactured today for home audio that could meet that i mean we're not even i'm maybe not even the big sure guys from like jtr that? oh you think so yeah, I don't. I don't even think the big the big things from JTR. I'd be even... I'd be kind of shocked if one of those dual 18s. And there's also what's that the it's got C in the name with the 24s from SI. So so while you guys are thinking about that, this is an interesting comment, and I've spoken to numerous companies that have that have uh, talked to THX, and and THX actually approaches companies to get their speakers certified. And I'm not going to mention any names, but I will tell you. From my discussions with particular companies they said that they submitted their speakers for thx and they would have easily met the requirements but the certification process was so expensive yeah. that they just decided not to do it so don't necessarily assume if a speaker is not thx certified that it can't meet those requirements i mean i've got speakers in my room that are not thx certified that would exceed most if not all current thx certified speakers in some of the key metrics Probably most of the key metrics. I would but, guess so. Yes. Yeah, but um, but yes, the process is expensive, and those companies never would have bothered to put them. There's through. A, there's a lot of licensing fees involved, yeah. and they're expensive, and they're like annual, and they're, yeah. they're like we're talking about. So five so, that, so think about this for a minute. Um, THX certification for speakers is usually costly, and these are the most inexpensive THX certified speakers you've seen. The fact that Monoprice can do a speaker that's competently engineered like this get THX certification and then throw an Atmos driver on top, even if you don't need it and only charge $500 each means that they plan on selling a shitload of these because they have to do the quantity to, to make up for, you know, the license I think, fees. I think there's more to this story though, because Clarity actually yeah. did some work to help basically <laughs> leverage quantity across multiple manufacturers and reduce yeah. costs. Cl right? Clarity, I think, I don't know how much I really want to say about this, but I think, 
if you want a, a THX certified product, go to Clarity. Or if you want to like, if you want to launch a THX certified product, Clarity is a. You should talk to Clarity Audio, basically. So, I don't know how much I, re, I can really say more about that, but um, their their licensing fees, Monoprice might, might not be paying as much as if they weren't partnering with Clarity. Let's just put it that way. I think some of this has been publicly said, but maybe we could just ask them and get like a publicly acceptable statement. Because I know what you're talking about, and I thought for some reason this was published before. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember what was said and what wasn't, but I know I was told some things. I'm like, I don't know how much I, I should really say. Well, I'll keep my mouth shut, but I thought, <laughs> I thought it had been published. Yeah, so like, well, I, I will say this, though. I, if I can move us along, we've got this other speaker that's not going to get oh, its yeah. fair shake, and I feel like we got to talk about it. Well, Next. let's yeah, let's move on. I'm going to do a little screen share. So the next speaker we're looking at is the Revel M126BE. They're 4,000 a pair, which sounds like a lot, but when you look at what's involved in Revel Engineering, and James, you've reviewed two or three speakers from Revel already, and they've always been up, you know, right? kind of best in class <laughs> kind of products. So let me, um, let me share my screen. I mean, I think there's probably people watching this who, I mean, I, I walked into this when James came over kind of hoping that the underdog, the monoprice, would sound as good or better than the Rebel. I, I really actually was hoping that would yeah, be true. Yeah, you was rooting for the mono price speakers. I was. <laughs> because, so if you guys are thinking that like we're blind by value, like uh, not value, by price, that we, you know, like many reviewers, there's this accusation that if it costs $4,000, it sounds better simply because it costs more. And it's not true. It's just, you know, I'm just going to say, I actually walked in here hoping for the opposite. And um, the measurements of both look so good that I thought maybe, but the Rebel's measurements looked better and then ultimately sounded better. So I think well, we got to go And you, gotta, you guys have to realize that Harman has put a lot of engineering behind their speakers and the measurements and having an anechoic chamber and actually applying real science, not fake news. Um, it pays off. And then when you have an unlimited budget, because this is for a mass marketed for a mass company like Harman to do a, a bookshelf speaker at four grand a pair, that's a lot of budget to put towards a speaker with only two drivers in it. And when you do those kind of budgets, you could use the very best materials like the beryllium tweeter. And there's a lot of advantages to the beryllium. It's a lighter, stronger material. The resonance is way higher up beyond the bandwidth of audibility. They also have a waveguide on this tweeter that helps to control the dispersion to have better matching the directivity matching with the mid range. And I'm sure when we show the measurements, you could point that out in it. So there's just a lot of stuff that you're not seeing in the speaker other than it just looks pretty when you look at it. Yeah, there's a huge amount of science and engineering. Look at this picture, Gene, that's that's the tweeter. That's the waveguide I have in my hand, right? Look yeah. at the tweeter motor, the motor for that tweeter, right? That little one inch uh, brilliant dome tweeter, the motor is like bigger than your fist. It's, huge. it's the biggest motor I've ever seen for a tweeter. Um, it, and it weighs a lot too. I mean, that's just a big magnet. So it's yeah. like a, it's a pretty amazing motor. So and let's, and let's talk about why you would want a big motor on a, on a tweeter. The reason why you guys want a big uh, magnet on is two reasons actually. Number one is it has more motor force. So you increase sensitivity of the driver. And number two is heat dissipation too. Because a lot of times you get um, a tweeter with these little neodymium magnets and they can't dissipate the heat as much. So they get compression. They don't play low down in frequency as much as this one. This probably has a very low resonant frequency. This tweeter probably has a resonant frequency of five or 600 hertz. Whereas you get some of these tweeters with these little neodymium slugs, they, you know, their resonant frequency is three times higher than that. Yeah, I, I would just add there's probably a third reason, which is that typically linear motor designs, basically motor designs that allow more excursion with less distortion, tend to also be larger. And even tweeters tend to need to use linear motor design. So this probably, given that JBL Harman has patented quite a few, has a linear motor design that necessitated this size. Yeah, that's impressive. Um, and then look at the look at the woofer here too. I mean, this is a cast basket. It's got a it's got a um, uh, vented pole piece here. Pretty large magnet structure, it looks like, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, really, uh, it's a substantial woofer. It's, um, the thing can play pretty loud. I mean, it, like that's been a Harman thing for JBL or Aval, right? They, they don't want compression, thermal compression, as you say. So like these drivers are, are 
very heavily, I can almost say over engineered, right? So that'll never happen, right? You can play these things really loud for, for like a, just a, all right, the form factor of a, a bookshelf speaker with a 6.5 inch woofer and one inch dome tweet is very common. But this is not a very common like design for that, right? This is like maxes out what you can do with that design, th this speaker, right? So yeah. it's so, you see so many speakers with that, that form factor, but this is like the ultimate expression of that. And um, the price is justified. These parts are all the, the, the best that money can buy for this type of design. Yeah. And so I mean, the magnet's almost as big as the woofer. <laughs> it is. Yes. And I really didn't want them to be worth the money, but but you can see where the money went and it <laughs> made a difference. Yeah, it's a pretty impressive uh, just uh, everything it about it. And if, if you compare this back to the amount of price we saw earlier, you can see the difference in the drivers. <laughs> yeah. These are definitely of another level. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I am surprised, not that it makes much of a difference, but I'm surprised they didn't offer buy amp capability or buy wire capability on these. Well, they probably recognize that that's not necessary. Yeah, there's no reason to do that. <clears throat> and I, and I, I'm grateful for that. It's like, what? It encourages yeah. bad behavior. It's, it's you not, know, that's one thing you got to give Harmon credit for. They don't, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't adhere to the BS. You know, you never see them talking about you need to use a certain cable with their speakers. They don't. Yeah. They just they stick to the science, and I really appreciate that. I know all the people that work there. They have some of the best engineering in the industry and it, and it just shows how they can make a product like this. I mean, even like the port design here, you see the port is flared, so it probably minimizes any type of turbulence. Did you hear any turbulence out of that port when you were cranking them up? I probably, I doubt I you didn't were. Hear anything. We didn't hear any signs of compression or distortion when we cranked them up. Yeah. And I'll say I was feeling inside that port with my hand because I was curious. Harman, uh, for people who don't know this, got sued by Bose for essentially copying their flared port design and uh, when the court case went through, well, I think ultimately Bose won the case. Uh, the the view seems to be that they both invented the same port design separately by accident, and oh, it's wow. different. It's different from what most people think. So most people think that a flared port is basically a cardboard tube with like little flares on the end. But actually, the patent that they went after, the original proper flare design that the study showed to be better, flares gradually all the way to the center. So it's, there's no straight section really. And uh, the shape of the entire port, the shape of the entire port is flared. And when you feel this, it shows that, and that's a sign of a well done port. And most are not made that way because it's actually hard and expensive to do that. Gotcha. That's a great point. So is this, um, this Harman spinorama data or is this what you did? That's Harman's. That's the one they sent me for the exact same unit that I measured, right? So the site, the one that I, measured up for the site is that exact same model. It's not you know, just the same speaker, speaker line, but it's the same speaker. And so they, they tested that and they sent me it and then we compared it. And, we, and if you look to, at my Spinorama, um, they're actually very, it's a very close match. The, so those are ours and um, the shape is the same. You know, yeah. don't, don't the only real uh, difference is my, you can see more high end roll off and the high frequencies like above like 15 kilohertz, right? To 20 kilohertz. Which could be the microphone. Yeah, I, I, I'd say, I think it was due to the windscreen on my microphone. You know, I can't, if it's, if there's any wind at all, I can't really use the, I have to use the windscreen, right? And that does attenuate the very high frequencies a little bit. It could also be as, as messy as the microphone itself. But for the most part, we get a really good um, match, you know, in, in our measured responses. Yeah, that does look really incredible. I mean, it's very linear here. And um, I don't know if, did you have any, yeah, here we go. So why don't you talk about why this is a good measurement as well? Matt, you wanna give well, this? I, it's just seriously impressive. So <laughs> this, what you can see here is that the on-axis response is very, very flat. And then every angle after that basically is tracking the same it's just at a lower level. You know the what? shape is staying. You same. should explain though, um, what the graph, like all those lines mean, because like, okay, we can see that the top line is also you and me and Gene, we know that the top line is almost always in these type of graphs, these waterfall graphs is the on axis response. Right. It's always going to be the most prevalent, right? Cause it's, yeah. it's closest to the microphone. So every line that, that kind of looks like it's falling from that is the off axis response. So this yeah. is, the on axis and the off axis response. And this goes out to hundred degrees. So see that like that blue solid blue, like shape in front of that, 
that's the shape of the response at 100 degrees and everything between that and the top line is between 100 degrees and the on-axis yeah, response. some increment of that. Now, some of you may be hearing me say, like, look how closely it follows, but saying, well, no, it doesn't. Look at what's going on above 10 kilohertz. So for the most part, all dome tweeters tend to beam. And what that means is that they become more directional. The response falls off with angle uh, more as you get higher in frequency. So ideally, you wouldn't want to see that. But our argument has long been nobody's hearing is all that sensitive up that high anyway. So having the tweeter fall off to the side more is probably not a not major a problem. Yeah. And but you're not rest... listening 100 degrees off axis from No, the... you're not. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not. Um, but the rest of the response is really, really flat and even. And uh, so this really shows an extremely well-engineered speaker. And if you go back to the spinorama data we were looking at before, one of the effects of this excellent data is that you actually see, so here's another look. Sorry, I'm trying to find the spinorama. That's well, fine. Okay. So here I'm pointing like everybody can see what I'm pointing at, but <laughs> here on the graph, you know, you've got your on axis and, li and listening axis. They look really flat. You can see that the early reflection access also shows basically the same exact shape. You know, the fact that there's, there's like a little like peak in the response on axis. What is that about three kilohertz? and it goes away off axis is probably a sign that there's some reflection right directly on that goes away off. And that's not a big deal. Might be a little bit of a, like a waveguide kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. But one of the things is that you really want to see consistency, right? We've talked about that a lot. And one of the things that happens when you have that consistent response is that the directivity index, the thing that's labeled DI, and those are the dotted lines on the bottom. You want those to be basically flat. And what it's you can see close. here is that red one practically is flat. Yeah. And that's a, that's a sign of a really well-engineered speaker. And the one above it, which is actually the listening axis DI, right? The one above it is the sound power. I think that the... Oh, that's the... Oh, the, okay. So the red one is the first reflection DI. That one's totally flat. Yeah, the sound power, I think what's going on there is we're seeing some of the effects of getting all the way around the speaker, right? Yeah, that incorporates yeah. all the all around the speaker with the red one just is kind of mostly focuses on the front hemisphere. So it's like, how directional is the speaker on the front hemisphere? Yeah. Is, is the red one, whereas whereas the the black dotted line is like how directional is a speaker period at all angles, of which all. includes behind the speaker, above the speaker, below, right? Yeah, yeah all, all angles. I think I think it's also incredible that um, Harmon measured the speaker they sent you, and then you were able to get similar measurements. They did this in an anechoic chamber that cost probably $100,000 or more. Yeah. Oh, way no, more yeah. than way that. More. Yeah, way more. Yeah. You need to add some zeros to that. That's over okay. Million. All right. So let's say they're, let's say their anechoic chamber costs a million bucks. You're doing this basically <laughs> in your backyard on a 12 foot, 13 foot platform. Not and... quite that high, but it's, it's high. It's like, like 7.5 feet. It's, it's amazing that you're able to get this kind of consistency in your measurements. And, and we have to thank Harmon again because Harmon took your measurements on a different speaker and they compared it to their measurements and we kind of normalized our response. So we're, we're doing the best we can to measure as close as you can to a full anechoic response down to 200 hertz. Sure. I have to give credit here to uh, Mark Glazer at Harmon. He's like their senior engineer. He actually helped me get these measurements going. So like, like help me understand them and, and it just help me measure speakers. Right. So like, um, he, he sent us the measurements for these M one, two, six PEs. And actually the first speaker I re reviewed was the Revell M one, six contrary to twos. And so like, uh, he helped, that was what I learned how to measure with. Right. And he, he had a lot to do with helping me like, um, learn how to, you know, teach me, like like uh understand what what i'm doing and so like um ravel is actually uh has been very helpful for us so mark mark at ravel in particular yeah no they're great people and you can see here the polar map pretty yeah, awesome beautiful response. beautiful it's like you it couldn't ask like squid anymore yeah you couldn't ask right. for better except for maybe okay above 15 kilohertz but yeah. ab below that it's just uh, it's just a uh, uh, really, really, really good, you know? There's a small handful of speakers that would, from a, purely from an objective measurement standpoint, would measure a little better than the speaker. Uh, the ones that I can think of actually cost quite a bit more than this. Yeah. Uh, and our studio monitors as well, so you kind of expect them to be that well, much better. 
I'm kind of wondering, um, James, you recently reviewed that Philharmonic bookshelf speaker. I know that that thing measured incredibly well. Yes, it's excellent. Yeah, among the yeah. best I've ever measured, yes. And what was that? How much did that cost a pair? That was a little less than this, uh, right? Well, well okay, Philharmonic is, no, is not in business anymore. Who, who made those speakers? Sad, um, yeah. but, but you can still get that design from, you can get those speakers that model from Salk Sound. Now, Salk charges, I think, twenty around twenty three hundred for a pair of those, and so like, and they also they're excellent speakers, really good. They're less expensive than these. Are they better or worse? Matter of opinion, you'd have to like. They're they're both just really. I mean, these and and those are just uh, fantastic speakers, you know. So, I don't know if you you'd have to like A B compare them to decide which is. You like more yeah you know? the the Ravel is smaller so i would just say if somebody's cross shopping and size matters and cost doesn't because these are quite a bit more expensive uh these speakers are physically quite a bit smaller than those bmrs yes they're, they're physically small the bmrs do dig quite a bit deeper i mean those the bmrs uh very large cabinet and uh, they're tuned to like almost below 30 hertz one thing I, I give these because of their their massive motors on the the Ravel speakers i think there's a good chance they could play uh, a bit louder, right? They have better power handling. That's just a guess on my part. That's conjecture. I don't really know for sure. But if I had to guess, I would say these could probably get, might have a dynamic range advantage over the, the BMRs. Gotcha. So this question just popped up. I don't know if you guys wanted to take a look and answer it or not. Sure. So I'll just say that speakers of this type in general will never be perfectly time aligned. Uh, that either would require a, a sloped enclosure stepping of the woofer and tweeter so that the woofer sticks out a bit or uh, DSP. So no, the woofers and tweeters and the speaker are not going to be time aligned, um, but they are going to be uh, basically in phase. Yes. And the reason we know that they're in phase without even looking at the response. impulse response is because the frequency response yeah. showed that and across all the angles. So one of the reasons why you don't show this, if I can try to answer for you, but you, you agree or disagree is that when Harmon basically did their research on what measurements mattered for sound because these are minimum phase devices basically what they found was that if there was a problem in the impulse response it would show up in the frequency response and that there's no reason to look at one over the other yeah i mean if you're going to look at any measurement look at the frequency response i don't a lot of people you know there's so much misunderstanding about impulse responses and stuff responses that i see all over like like social media about, about audio in general right that like there's no you don't hear impulse responses you don't hear step responses you hear frequency response and like you can look at a frequency response to make some like uh you can to, to look at some aspects of the speaker's behavior but not really that's much that's going to be useful for the user's experience right you really want to look at the the frequency response for that well the step response and impulse response can show you some things that were done on how the speakers were engineered, how they might behave, but they don't, from an audible standpoint, they don't really tell you anything that matters too much. You if, know? You Unless, read, uh, if you read Sound Reproduction by Dr. Floyd Tool, I mean, he beats you with the frequency response and how resonances matter. And if you have, a, if the speakers have a real problem with it, they're not gonna integrate well in the frequency or in the amplitude response. That's you know, really a lot. I think it might be worth mentioning. Okay, Matt. Matt showed me you and me, Gene. Yes. He he showed us the the step response that the clip short. stereo file measured for the clip horns. All right, and it was just you'd think this thing was just it would sound just terrible, right? From this uh, the the step response. I happen to think they do sound terrible, but you go ahead and give. I your... don't. I think the clip horns know, sound like just them. fine. I don't think they sound like okay. There's they're not sound perfect. They're not like. Ravels in, in terms of fidelity, but a lot of people love them. I don't think they sound bad. The step response is just, I mean, like from a academic standpoint, it's awful, right? But they don't sound that bad. And whatever, it, it, it whatever their problem is, you're gonna you're gonna see it more in like in the realm of frequency response, you know. And well, and I'll say this: you can actually engineer a speaker to have a flat response. It can be in phase, but not time aligned to such an extreme extent that the measurement of just the frequency response might look good, 
but the step response would look horrible. I mean, the, the clip shorn actually is probably somewhat of an example. That doesn't have a great frequency response, yeah. but it's good enough <laughs> that it would shock you to see how awful that step response is. So I wouldn't say that a step response is of no utility. I think if I could try to put words in Floyd's mouth, which he's going to hate, <laughs> um, I would say that he probably wouldn't argue that you should never look at it. It doesn't matter at all. I think it's that he was kind of going with the for the most part, with most speakers, there's no reason to expect it to do what that clip speaker did. I mean, you wouldn't expect the woofer to be, let's say, like 10 plus milliseconds, or I think it was actually like more than that, like 30 wow. or 40 milliseconds off the woofer from the tweeter, for instance, or the mid range from the tweeter and the woofer. Like, they, I remember seeing, I think the tweeter. They didn't have enough room to show the woofers. That's delay. right. The woofer didn't even fill in the graph. The, the mid range was like, it fell off the graph. Yeah, it was so, so like, bad. With any normal non-horn speaker, you would never see that. It would be like impossible to cause that kind of a severe problem. And so at that point, basically, it's just phase. You, you just want the phase alignment to be right, and then the frequency response should be good. But when you get into some goofy stuff like horn designs um, or possibly some really unusual cabinet designs, you do need to pay attention to that because you could conceivably have a situation where they are so far apart that it might. But I think the issue still remains. How audible is that? It's probably audible. It's just probably not nearly as audible as many other artifacts. I, I, because I would, there's other there's other bigger offenses. If you have a cat, yeah. if you have bad driver resonances or cabinet reson resonances, you're going to hear that whether you're on or off axis. That's just a problem, a coloration in the speaker that's going to be <laughs> way more audible than some of this other stuff. You know what? Me, me and Matthew, these are the kind of arguments we get into that just True. keep on going and going and going. So we won't bore your our viewership anymore yeah. about this one particular little thing, right? We trust us though, we could go on and on and just like never ending, like, well, what about this? What about that, right? So I think we'll just next question, next question. What's the next question? The next question is 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 Monoprice working on fill orange towers? Yes, they are. We're gonna be covering those at Cedia. Well, I don't think they've announced them yet. I thought I think they well, were they gonna... just did apparently. <laughs> they just did. You know, I always wait to announce things when they tell me the embargo dates and then other yeah. magazines don't follow it and they publish it anyways. So by the time anybody sees this video from Monoprice, oh, CEO okay. will already start. Yeah, you're right. It's like Sorry, in a couple guys. of days. It's <laughs> yeah. in a couple of days, but yes, Monoprice, I don't want to say anything more about it, but yes, Monoprice is working on it. It's uh, the cat's out of the bag now. Uh -oh. Sorry, sorry, Metal Price, but yeah, they're they're doing something. I won't say anything about it. You'll learn about it and I'm actually writing a preview article about it right now. It'll be on our site in a when a week, right? Sometime after Cedia. So you, you learn all about that. And they're also, so you, ooh, I don't want to say anything more. They're also working on something that's really cool. Uh-oh. We'll save that for the our, the article, okay? Yeah, okay, definitely. Yeah. So so this is an interesting question. How well would Arc Genesis or DRAC affect frequency response? Matt, you are, you are kind of the debunker of auto EQ. And <laughs> I, I'm going to let you, I'm just going to defer this question to you because you always sure. have good answers for this. To be honest, this is, I don't think we could have had two more perfect speakers for talking about when auto room EQ can become beneficial versus not. So the argument that Floyd Tool has always made, and it's whether people want to admit this or not, it's true, is that if the speaker's response over its uh, overall, all the angles basically around the, the full axis of the speaker are not consistent. So the response changes a lot as you move to the sides. What happens when you take an in-room response is you get a, a basically a weighted average, weighted more heavily towards the on-axis stuff than towards the reflections, but it still includes all of that. And then it's trying to flatten that out. But if the response isn't the same at all those different angles, then what you've corrected doesn't necessarily match what you hear. And the reason for that is our ears do something that the microphone cannot. And I, I wrote about this in the article I wrote about microphone versus ears. So our brain is a very, very sophisticated sound processor. And it's capable of looking at the time difference between the sound, figuring out for a, a variety of ways, not just the time, but also it can tell the direction it's coming from due to things like our head response transfer function, basically how the frequency response is changing, uh, tells our brain where the sound is coming from. And it filters out a lot of those later reflections coming off of the wall, for instance, so that we don't pay as much attention to them. I mean, it does that because if we didn't do that, it would be hard for us to pay attention in a conversation. And uh, by doing this, when you then EQ that average response, you've actually EQ'd a different response than your brain hears. 
and it means you've made something flat, but you don't hear it as flat. So the, the, the answer here is that Arc Genesis, Dirac, basically any of the room corrections can't fix that. You've got to start with a good speaker. And if you don't start with a good speaker, then all you're doing is putting a Band-Aid on something in, in the wrong way. You know, it'd be like trying to put a little tiny Band-Aid on a big gaping wound. Now, on the other hand, if you've got a speaker that has a very even and consistent response, especially like the Ravel, then yes, you can actually start to improve the response further. I mean, you saw there were little wiggles in the response. They remained consistent, but it wasn't perfectly flat. So Arc Genesis and Direct would be able to further flatten that. Conceivably, that will improve sound. I happen to like Dirac and use it sometimes, but not always. But one thing that I will readily admit that James, you, you've heard these listening tasks we've done, a really well-engineered speaker doesn't seem to need this. Yeah. And so even though it can make it measure better, I mean, Dirac especially can make things look absolutely perfect. The reality is when you then put on a bunch of music and listen to it, they don't sound that different. In some cases, they don't sound different at all. Yeah. Uh, we went through, I think, with one day, like maybe 10 songs, and I think it was like three of them we couldn't tell a difference at all. Three of them we weren't sure which one we liked better. You know, three or four of them we liked a little bit better with direct on kind of thing. Yeah, it was like the, the difference when you use, like, I, I personally, I don't think it's worth using. Like, like Matt, Matt, we probably don't 100% agree, but in, in my case, I don't think it's really worth using auto correction on a really good speaker. There's just not much that it can do. It could, but here, but I would say though, if you if you don't run the uh, the calibration routine correctly, then it's just gonna it's just gonna mess everything up. Why would yeah. you run? And and there's so many. Matt really knows what he's doing when he's running when he's calibrating a, a speaker with with any room correction, right? And and even then, what what can how how much does it really improve the sound? Well, what are the chances that a guy who's just like read a few lines from a, a, like an AVR manual is going to run those calibration routines correctly? The uh, room a, th this is actually we should save this debate for another video. Yeah. We, we could go really into this. I'll, I'll just say that what there's a lot more harm that can be done on, on a wide level than any good that can be done, in my opinion. And that's a debate for another video, though. And usually, yeah. usually you're better off like with Arc, and now with Odyssey's editor app, you're usually better off limiting the correction. Oh to yeah. Base Just frequencies, you transition know, frequency and lower. Yes. Frequency of the room. Yeah. Right. That's, we yeah, should we should do this as a as a topic when I get back from Cedia. I'll schedule a live stream to talk about room correction and Matt. Maybe you can pull <laughs> some measurements on some of the stuff you've done. Sure. And, yeah. Yeah. We could yeah, definitely I, talk about that. Oh, dude, when we do that, it's people <laughs> are gonna be there's gonna be some upset people because a lot of people they they, they will stake their life on the their the opinion that like Odyssey and any like WPO or MCAC is it's so much better, right? Yeah. I, I we we don't agree. I, I think I can speak for Max that we don't necessarily agree with that. No, in fact, actually, there's a lot of room corrections on the market that I think make speakers sound significantly worse. One was yeah. just posted up there. I have like to Like Wipow, for example. Why, I, I hate yeah. to do this because I like I do like Yamaha. I do think Yamaha makes good yeah. product, but they're the kind of company when they have their own technology, they double down on it, whether it's good or bad. And Wipow has really been a mixed bag. In my opinion. It doesn't <laughs> do anything for bass. It doesn't do anything beneficial for bass, which is the most important area yeah. of correction you can do. Luckily, Yamaha has listened and they've employed PEQ tunable down to like 16 hertz manually. So that's incredible. You could do it through their receiver editor app, through the web interface. That's very useful. But their wipeout uh, full range correction, either turn it off or limit how much it's going to do. So if it starts boosting things 10 dB at 14 kilohertz, I would scale that back to a couple of dB or just flatten it out. I found... Um why power to make sound worse every time I've used it. <laughs> and I've actually measured from every generation at this point that's been around and just really found that it's it's made things worse measurably too to the point that I question what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. We should save this conversation for the next video. But it's so much fun. It is it is. I, I really want to go into it now. I really do, but you know I, <laughs> No, it's a you know, people complain because we do these live broadcasts, they're too long, they're like over an hour long. But I'm like, you know what? It's like watching a movie, except we're a lot less exciting and <laughs> yeah, exciting. Yeah. well I, I just wanna say again back to the Ravels. I know I mentioned this earlier, but 
I didn't want them to sound as good as they did because they were so expensive. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we could get on this video and say, you know what, we've got this excellent $500 a piece, $1,000 a pair speaker, and they sound so good. And then we've got these for $4,000 a pair, and they sound about the same, right? That would be such a neat story. That'd be a good story. Yeah. The reality is this: not only are these built better, they look better, they're smaller, they sound better. And in terms of what I mean by that, I noticed some weird oddities with the sound stage and the mono prices. Nothing that I would complain about. Just it wasn't the best I'd ever heard. Um, the BMRs actually are a good example from Philharmonic that I thought had a really good sound stage. The JTRs have a really good sound stage. My own. Gettys, uh, Gedleys have a, a really excellent sound stage. These Ravels did as too. I was super impressed with the sound stage, the depth, uh, the the evenness of the presentation, the placement was good. The treble was smoother than on the mono price. Um, they they just sounded like they didn't feel like they were any more or less bright. They were kind of equally neutral, but they just felt more listenable in that range. Well, I think we we should have pre prefaced this um, live stream with uh, the the comment that we're not. I, I, we weren't really doing a shootout between these speakers because of no. that yeah. price difference. Oh, yeah, They're no, just no. too different. We're just covering speakers that we've reviewed recently, okay? Yeah. As, so, for, the, as for the mono price versus Ravels, I'm going to say that, well, Matt might have noticed something a little bit, I don't know what he says is a little bit of uh, some oddities with the sounds. I didn't. With the, with the mono price and like, but I've had I had a lot more time to set them up. Yeah, and like, I didn't and, and fiddle with them and like you know. So like I thought they sound the their sound stage is fine. I didn't notice any oddities, but like but when we, we set them up, we only like we just we did the basic thing. Like it, it took us ten minutes to set them up. We didn't spend a lot of time since we didn't have a whole lot of time to deal with that tonight. You know. So I wanted to bring up this this point. Um, I see this often where someone looks at a consumer product and says, well, you know, you can get the pro product. It's, it plays louder. It's better. It's cheaper, whatever. Uh, one thing I think people sometimes need to realize is they, these, are design, these products are designed with different goals in mind. So a, a JBL horn-loaded speaker like the 708P that this person's talking about is really designed for, you know, whether it's for a large um, environment, a recording studio or, or a movie theater, the design goals are different. I could tell you this much, like if you look at JBL's top speaker, their M2, their Master Reference 2, which arguably is the most accurate, one of the most accurate speakers ever made, especially for horns are concerned, versus a Revel Salon 2. Well, on paper, the M2 sounds like that's the better speaker because it has more output, it has more sensitivity. But I'll tell you this much, I know the top guys at Harman, like the Floyd Tools and the Sean Olives, in their in their personal systems, they're using Salon twos. They're not using M twos, and it's not always just an aesthetic thing. I think in blind tests, um, I still think that dome drivers and and cone drivers still can have the advantage. <laughs> Ooh. I'm sorry to say, I, okay. I have personal I, biases against horns. I always I always hear the horn in a horn. You know, yeah. that might be like a placebo type effect. You know, you, you just can't get it out of your head. But I know that Matt will very vehemently disagree with the idea that domes are just... Gene, I, I you think just got to come great. to your mind. You'll, you'll have a different opinion. Now. I've heard the JBL M2s multiple times in, in demos at Cedia in controlled listening environments. They sounded amazing. Like for, mu for movies, the dynamics, everything was amazing. But I could still tell I was listening to a horn speaker. That's just me. Yeah, I will say this, and I don't, I can't argue with it because it's their science. But um, Sean Olive has said that in their listening tests, that while the M2 I think was the second highest scoring speaker they ever tested, the Ravels, not this one, it was a higher end model, was the highest scoring. Salon twos, Salon twos, yeah. And he argued that the dispersion, the wider dispersion, may actually have contributed to that higher score because, you know, there isn't actually a metric for what is good directivity. Um, preferred directivity. Preferred directivity, that's right. And so um, the M2 looks better in those measurements than the Revell does, but the, re the directivity index is a little bit lower on the Revell, wider dispersion. So that was his argument. And that's one reason, as I understand it, that they all chose those speakers was that they were the highest scoring speaker that they had ever tested. Me personally, you know, these are beautiful speakers. They're smaller than the 708Ps and they sound really good, but I, I totally get the case. And I think if somebody's comfortable with the look of that studio monitor and the size, 
Uh, they very well probably sound just as good. They probably are more dynamic. They're a bigger speaker, so they yeah. should play louder. Um, and uh, it probably do provide more value. And I think that's very commonly true with the pro stuff, that there's some value there. Just not every pro speaker is as good as the JBL stuff. There's also the, the question of, uh, like, as you said, directivity for, like this, the Revolves is a wide directivity speaker. So they're, they're, that might be better for like, it might be more suited for some people's tastes where the, the 708Ps are gonna have like a tighter, more controlled directivity. And some people might enjoy that more. The, there's room for both. I would love to feel my hands in some of those 708Ps personally. That's all good. I've done comparisons between like speakers of different directivities. So as Matt and um, we, they both sound great to me. I can easily yeah. live with either, you know? Right. Well, last thing somebody asked, uh, how do we feel about clip speakers? We did do a review on the RP 8000 Fs. Yes. James, you basically had kind of like um, an epiphany with those speakers or Matt, you, Matt did. Matt, because Matt, Matt did. I did. Cause yeah. I've never liked clips in the past. I've always found them to sound too bright and, you know, especially the classic sound of like the clip horns and any of the speakers that came out of that the heritage, the heritage, right. The heresies, the, uh, the scholars, the scholars all those different yeah. designs, right. Uh, to me had a fairly similar house sound, which was that they were not neutral. They were bright. They were very efficient. They played very loud. Uh, but they didn't tend to have a lot of bass and they tended to be very, very bright. And I didn't like them. I found them to sound harsh. And then they came up with other speed. I'm going to forget the model names, but like they came up with a variety of other models since then that had a more house friendly, spouse friendly type design. They still tended to have that characteristic. They were very sensitive. They played loud, but they just didn't. They were bright and harsh to me. And then this reference speaker came out. And, and it didn't sound anything like the other speakers I'd heard from Klipsch. They actually were very neutral. So what I would say is I don't generally like Klipsch speakers that much, but they do make some very good speakers, and they're a very good value at this point, too. Yeah, they're an incredible value. Yeah, they really yeah, are. Yeah, we did the, the review. You can read about the, uh, eight, as you said, the RP8. Was it the R, R, RP8000F? Yeah, yeah all, these, right. all these like numbers and letters are just random yeah it, it, it's a really good speaker it's uh it's a the, okay of lately like the the reference the new reference premiere series is like it's in my opinion is better than the older reference series mm -hmm. it's probably I, I might it might be speculative to say this but i think that's probably the most neutral speakers that clips has made so far at least for home audio um it's really good we have the review I think any of the, the the new reference series, I think they're kind of all chasing the same response versus a neutral response. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's better than their, their previous like target curve. So like um I, I like what Klipsch is doing. I hope they keep on doing it. And that's like it's yeah, just go and listen to them. They're they're pretty darn good speakers. Last last uh, thing I'll I'll put oh, up here yeah. comment wise the people are asking about the new Polk Legends with uh, that were designed by Stu, um, who's been there for over 40, 40 years. He's retiring soon. I got a chance to hear their entire Legend line um, at the Sound United event back in May. Was it May? The end of May, and I had to kind of bite my lip the whole time because I couldn't talk about them. I had to wait for them to be released. Well, they're announced now, so I can talk about them. We have an article on our website. I did a little uh, paragraph about my sound impressions of them. I was very impressed. Um, I was never a huge Polk fan, at least recently. Like I always thought that, like the R15, R, R15s or whatever, like the bookshelf speaker that you reviewed. Oh, um, yeah. That era of speaker with like that polycell tweeter, I always felt like those speakers were super bright and kind of ear bleeding to me. But I did like years ago, like the Monitor 5 Juniors when I was in high school and, and you know, with the um, but the polywoofers and the trilaminate tweeters. I always kind of had a liking for Polk, but I could never afford the SDA stuff. And uh, But I did hear them many times when I was a kid growing up, and I always liked that stuff. Well, now the new Legend series just kind of takes that to the next level because they're employing that kind of technology where they're doing the left minus right, right minus left using a common cable between the speakers and having two sets of drivers on 15 degree angled baffles. 
And I have to tell you, I, when I came into the room, I wasn't expecting it to be an SDA kind of speaker. I just looked at that and it reminded me of, of the movie Ruthless People, where Judge Reinhold is trying to sell these kids these giant speakers called the Dominator X. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is what this is what Polk must be doing. They must be making a speaker with a bunch of drivers on it because hey. more drivers is better. It's going to play louder. It's going to be Gene, bigger. Gene, don't but, rip on them because when you die, you can be buried in them. You can be buried in them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's great. That was what I was going to do with my status 18. But anyways, um, so when I did hear, when they put them on, I was like, holy shit. It sounded like there was surround speakers around me. It was just a huge sound stage that you don't typically hear from two channel. Well, at the same time, it had good imaging and good localization of instruments and stuff. It wasn't artificial sounding. And then after they finished their demo, they're like, that was just a two channel recording. That was just a two channel setup. And we're doing the left minus right, kind of like the Hapler circuit. So it's a very, it's a sophisticated crossover. Everything's done in the analog domain, but there's no DSP on it. And I was blown away. That was one of my favorite demos at the Sound United event. And we heard a lot of things that day. And even their little bookshelf speaker, and they had these kind of dimpled cones. They had like these turbine shapes on the cone, which is done to strengthen the cone. Anytime you do those kind of bends in the cone, it creates more stiffness. And then they do a lot of self dampening on the cones. So it, it was kind of like a nice, good send off for Stu, who's been there since Matthew Polk was there, to, to come up with basically the best speakers that I think Polk has ever made in the history of the company, which says a lot for a company that's been around for 40 or 50 years. So we definitely will be reviewing those. And, and James, if you can't measure those giant speakers, I'll send you their bookshelf speakers you can measure, but you got to hear the, the towers. You got you and Matt have to set up yeah, the towers. We got to set them up. Come on. Yeah. We got we, I, we need the people that are watching this to start rallying because he's like totally against the idea. Who wants well, who wants James and Matt to review the Polk Legend 800, the L800 SDAs? Give us a comment right now. If we get more than five comments, those speakers are going to you guys. There's hey, no you know what? I'll, I'm, I'm willing to review them as long as the people who vote to like – have me review them as long as they're willing to carry them up a ladder onto a stand, right? And, you know and, what? They're probably not going to measure well, though. I mean, given that they've got this. Yeah. The, the, uh, on one thing How do you say about those, like that? Well, That's I, the I thing. I think they're probably hard We, we to could learn about their directivity. We could learn about them. But what would that say about what they're really doing? I don't know how to, like, we would just find out about them, but it, we we have nothing to compare them to since it's such an idiosyncratic speaker. Yeah. Well, so, you could at least do CEA 2010 measurements on those dual 10 inch woofers and see how much base yeah. output they have. Do you want to, Eugene, if you want to carry them out, you know, 200 feet into a field, okay. We'll More see. than that. Yeah. That's, that's how far it is from the house, but it's uh, yeah, probably it, closer well, to the it's, it's not too bad the in the field, but at least we'll have to carry it up a ladder. But, you know, I don't know how much they weigh. If they were like, a hundred pounds. I They're can't. under a hundred pounds. I would imagine. They're not that heavy. I, I think you guys can manage. Mm, well, we'll see. All right. I'll look. I want to hear them. I'm really curious. Okay. I'll, I'll, if you help me carry them around, Matt, um, if they're, if they're like really heavy, because like, I can't, I'm, I'm carrying these big power speakers up a ladder. Right. And then setting up just <laughs> right. And I'm doing it so that I don't That's scratch the finish. Of they're 118 pounds. Here you go. That's I, I can't, don't worry I, about scratching them. They're demo units. I, I can't lift them. It's not scratch. I can't even lift them. That's 120 pounds. I'll have to fly Hugo to help you. Yes. Flying Hugo. Yes. Okay. Well, then that's that's done. It's it's. Well, I, I want to hear these things. Hey, we'll do it like the Egyptians did when they built the pyramids. Here you go. Put them on blocks. Oh. On well, it, it doesn't work. I, I mean, we actually have a, a lawn cart that handles. A thousand pounds or you something. know, I was wondering this when you showed the picture of the Revels. I, I'm surprised that they did show the that they exposed the, the screws like that. I think there's good reason for it. So it's it's not ideal. Obviously, it would cause some reflections. I'm going to guess that they've they've minimized it to the point that they don't think it's audible. But the cabinet is curved, so in order to be able to put that in there and not have visible screws, you'd have to have access from behind. And because the cabinet is curved, you couldn't have access from behind so that you could really do that. So mm. I think it was just something you had to do. The same is actually true for these uh, mono price speakers. They have a curved cabinet, so all, everything's it. exposed. Yeah. So that's that, yeah. Okay. So just to recap, guys, because we kind of babbled on and went off uh, topic. <laughs> the mono price THX 365Ts, they're 500 bucks each. They have the Atmos up 
firing uh, tw uh, drivers in case you want to get into Atmos, but you can't seal them out your speakers. The center Oops. channel is the same speaker without the Atmos, and then the mid tweeters are oriented um, vertically for better dispersion characteristics and less lobing. Um, the Revels are the M126BE from their Beryllium line. They basically upgraded the, the tweeter to the Beryllium tweeter. And I think they made some other component upgrades, maybe in the crossover compared to the regular line. And these are four grand a pair. They also have towers yeah. with those beryllium tweeters. Um, both awesome speakers, both different speakers, different applications. I asked Monoprice several times uh, via emails, hey, can you guys make a version of that speaker without the upfiring driver? Because I've gotten probably, since you did that review, I've gotten probably five or six emails of people saying, I would buy that speaker in a heartbeat if it didn't have the Atmos driver and it was $100 cheaper. All I can say uh, is wow. there might be some good news on the horizon for these people, but maybe not with these particular speakers. I don't want to say anything more. Yeah, It'll be reviewed at CDL. But you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I know this has gone on long, but the the upcharge for that, like at most, my, it, it's nothing. The the speaker is so good for the money. Just the base performance of it is that yeah. that's. I don't even care. It doesn't ma matter. It's still a bargain with without the Atmos module like speaker. It's it's nothing. It's like a the 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 the, the regular performance of the speaker is so good that it doesn't make a difference. It's like you know, it's well. And I would argue. I would argue if you already have an Atmos set up and you're using like a Yamaha processor that has 56 DSP modes, you might be able to use that up far in, uh, speaker to do like some the DSP channels if you want to add a DSP layer. I mean, there, you can find some use for it. I mean, even if you're not yeah. going to use it for Atmos, you know, it doesn't make any difference if you use it or not. The speaker is still so good that I, I, I've yeah. heard this before. You, you've mentioned that the people have said this, but the speaker is so good that that's like it, it's not even a consideration. The Atmos module. It doesn't module, affect the value. Yeah, it doesn't affect the value. And I don't think that it actually would affect the price by a hundred dollars. My guess would be like at best twenty five dollars. Wow. I think people would be disappointed at how little it, of it is. It's just not get doing it. anything. I don't, I don't, I, we didn't, I didn't focus on on my review. I didn't really worry about too much because I was more concerned about the regular speaker, and the, the THX certified part of it. And it was, uh, it just proved to be a really good speaker and an excellent value. So whatever. Well, hopefully, you, hopefully they come up with an on wall version so people can use them as surround speakers too, you know? That'd be a good idea. They have the in walls. Yeah, they have the in walls. Those are pretty neat. I actually would be curious to see what those are like. I, I, now, I'll test out the Atmos module on this, um, and and we'll see if it provides a believable effect. I, you know, like Eugene, I've not really been impressed with ceiling reflected bouncy house Atmos speakers. <laughs> I don't find them to work as well. I can I have heard a couple that were really impressive, but like for every one I hear that works well, there's like twenty that don't. So I'm kind of yeah. curious how this one works out. Awesome. Well, guys, I think we're going to wrap this up. We looked today at the Monoprice and Revel speakers, totally different speakers, different applications, but both great in their category of product. I hope you guys found this uh, YouTube video informative. If you did, please thumb it up, subscribe to our channel, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. And Matt, James, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate your input tonight. This was awesome. We're not going to be doing a live stream next week because I'll be at Cedia. We're going to be doing a lot of live uh, Cedia stuff from, I think, Thursday through Saturday. I'm going to be on the, on the show floor covering all the different products, doing interviews. We're going to be releasing a bunch of videos after Cedia. So you're going to see a lot of new product coverage in these videos coming up. So guys, please make sure you subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss that. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.